The Mishnah and Kiddushin lists two categories of mitzvot in the context of the, of the family. The Mish, Perak Aleph Mishnah Zayin of Kiddushin begins first with mitzvot haben alaav and, and continues later with the mitzvot haav al haben. Now, the way this Mishnah appears in the Talmud Yerushalmi and similarly, in all manuscripts of the Mishnah, the two principles govern, governing relationship between parents and children appear in the opposite order. First, mitzvot ha'av ala ben, the mitzvot of the, of the parents to the children, and then mitzvot ha'ben ala av, the mitzvot of the child, children to the parents. When I, when I read this phraseology, mitzvot ha'av ala ben, mitzvot ha'ben ala av, I felt somehow a feeling of deja vu, that somehow this terminology reminds me of something. It took me a long time till I discovered what, what that was on the back of my mind. And I, till I later realized that there is an intertextual relationship between this Mishnah and the closing verse of Sifrei Nevi'im. Sifrei Nevi'im ends with the Pasuk telling us about the mission of Elio Hanavi in the future. Veheshiv lev avot al banim ve lev banim al avotam. See how similar this Pasuk is to the terminology in the Mishnah of mitzvot ha'av al aben, mitzvot ha'ben al av. Both the Mishnah and the verse deal with relationships between fathers and sons, beginning with first the father to the son, then the son to the father. Both use the preposition al to describe the nature of these relationships. The, there is, of course, a significant difference that the, the, the verse talks about the heart, the father's coming to the sons and the sons to, to the fathers through the heart, whereas the Mishnah talks about mitzvot, as mitzvot as governing the relationship between the, 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 the fathers and sons. And my guess is, most people, if I would ask, what seems more significant to link up the generations through the heart or through mitzvot laws, most people, I, I think, would go for the heart. However, I would like to point out in, th in thinking about the relationship between this closing verse of Nevi'im and this statement in the Mishnah to point out, uh, mention an essay written by Rav Kook that talks about the relationship between these two values. Rav Kook has a famous essay called Chacham Adif Minavi based on a statement in the Agarata that the Chacham, is, his role is more significant than that of the Navi of the Prophet. And Rav Kook, Rav Kook sees Prophets as people that are filled with vision, visionaries, poets, and of course the original Prophets themselves. They had very powerful vision and very direct, really responding or turning to different emotional aspects of the people listening to them. And as inspirational as these Nevi'im are, ultimately, Rav Cook points out, they failed. The Nevi'im came in order to change Am Yisrael during those troubled times, in the, in, during the times of the first Beit HaMikdash. And, and they ultimately, they did not succeed. And maybe in point, we know that I grew up in Manhattan, not far from the building of the United Nations. You enter the United Nations and they have beautiful verses from the Navi and from the books of Ishayo written on the walls. And we, we know that there's so little connection between the Psukim and what happens there in reality. So vision is very, is very important. However, vision alone is not enough to, have, to change people. Rav Kook says the Chacham, are like, um, which is a change in focus in the Torah after first temple times, that the role of the study of Torah 
and exactness in, in halakha became more significant, he says in many ways it's much grayer, like some gray bureaucrats that work on the nitty gritty of life. But so often, to really change people's lives, you have to get down to those details in the nitty gritty of life. Bref Cook, who himself is of course a great visionary, sees that the ultimate place we're, that we're trying to achieve is to link together the Chacham and the Navi. However, through the Halacha, hopefully ultimately to get back to that place that the Nevi'im wanted us to get to. Get to. And if I would make an analogy to what we're seeing now in the Mishnah, I would say Sifrei Nevi'im ends with a beautiful vision of, of children and parents being reunited through the heart. However, the Mishnah teaches us that this is going to happen not by lofty inspirational statements, but by defining the nature of the relationship, having the, the mitzvot of the parents to children, which the Tosefta lists, doing Brit Milah, Pidyon Aben, teaching them Torah, helping them achieve a, a livelihood, and helping them along finding a wife. Whereas the children, their role is to learn how to relate to and respect to their parents. By defining the relationship, we, we hope that, it will, that this will lead ultimately to that vision of the linkage of the hearts. Um, I'll make a general point before continuing that this, I believe the, safe, the, the, the Tanakh has a tremendous impact on the Mishnah. Even though rarely does the Mishnah quote Pesukim from the, from the Tanakh, the very fact that the Mishnah is the Torah Shvel Peh responding to the Tanakh, which is the Torah Shvechtav, and additionally, the book, the frame of reference known by the Rabbanim of the times of the Mishnah was the Tanakh, means that Tanakh is a very central source of deriving inspiration and associations to things that appear within the Mishnah. So I believe, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to develop this argument, that even though this verse in Sefer Malachi talking about the mission of Eliyahu Navi does not appear in the Mishnah, nevertheless it's underlying the messages that are taking place here in the Mishnah. And lest someone think that this is a um, associative connection and not based in, based in the text itself, let me take this argument one step further and further validate the textual basis. The, the last verse in Sefer Malachi we have to link up the hearts of the fathers and sons. But if this doesn't happen, the verse continues. Pen avo vi Lest I come and and strike the land cherem, that the land that the land will become barren or, or, or destroyed. Now, in fact. So what the Pasik is telling us, if this relationship is not restored, the land will be, the land will be destroyed. And in fact, this is the continuation of the Mishnayot in this first chapter of, of Masechet Kedushin. After the topic of, the, of mitzvot in the context of the family, uh, Mishnah Zayin, the next major topic in the Mishnah, is the relationship between mitzvot and the land in Eretz Yisrael. So let's turn now to Mishnah Yud. Whoever does a mitzvah, he will, um, it will be good for him, he will, his days will be extended, and he will inherit the land. But if you don't do mitzvot, then you'll get that negative opposite. The Mishnah continues, Kol shiyeshnu b'mikra b'mishnah uv'derech eretz, lo b'mhera u'choteh, sh'neamar, v'achut ha'mishulash lo b'mhera yinatek, v'kol she'eno lo b'mikra v'lo b'mishnah v'lo b'derech eretz, eno min ha'yishuv. Somebody who's not involved with mikra and mishnah, which is the study of Torah, or derech eretz, which means having a livelihood, he will, be, he will not be part of the Yishuv. He'll be cut off from the Yishuv. 
And I think this is the exact continuation of the, of the Pasuk, that that Eino Viketi Etaretz Cherem, you won't be no Cheldaret, you won't inherit the land, you won't extend your life, you won't have, won't be good for you, and you will Eino Mina Yishuv, you're cut off from the Yishuv. The, the, the continuation of the Mishnah parallels the continuation in the Pasuk itself. And even more so, as um, Rav Avri, Avram Wolfish has pointed out, that the um, what well, that which leads you to be cut off from the yeshuv, not being involved with the study of Torah and derech eretz, these are exactly the primary obligations of the father to son. In other words, so here we're having a direct connection. If we don't have the right relationship between avot ubanim, that will lead to the next generation will not be involved neither with Torah or with derech eretz. And that leads to hiketi at the aretz the land, the land becoming desolate. Now, relating to um, there's a riddle I would say relating to, to the the commentaries on on this verse in in, Yish, in Malachi of the heishiv lev avot al banim v'lev banim al avotam. Almost everybody if asked who are we talking about when we talk about linking the hearts of the father of who are we talking about in the Pasuk almost everyone would answer we're talking about the fathers and sons having a closer relationship the heishev lev avot al banim the hearts of the father going out to the sons v'lev banim al avotam the hearts of the sons going out to the father it's so human so understandable so it's very perplexing to see that almost not, none of the medieval commentators explained the pasuk in this context, they gave. They get. There are a number of commentaries. Some give commentaries that that's talking about. They say that the fathers will be machzer the children b'tshuva, and the children will be machzer the fathers in b'tshuva. Others explain that it means that both the fathers and sons will be chose b'tshuva. Others say avot al banim is talking about God and the Jewish people, which might have worked if it was av al banim. But since we believe in one God, Avot al Banim, it's it's hard to take Tanchun Hayushalmi's approach and see Avot as meaning God. So why isn't anybody explaining the pasuk based on the simple meaning, and why did why are they taking these such difficult paths to understanding the pasuk? Now the answer is because the beginning of this chapter in Malachi, the Jewish people ask God, Bema Nashuv. How will we return to you? And presumably, this is the answer, how the Jewish people will get back to God. So as a result, the commentaries understood somehow this Pasuk must be talking not about the relationship between fathers and sons, but rather the relationships with God. However, I believe the solution, and the solution presented by the Mishnah and Kedushin, is a deep understanding that the way for the generations to get back to God is by having the right relationship between the generations themselves. The previous verse in Malachi says, Zichru Torah Moshe Avdi, remember the Torah of Moshe, Asher Tzavit Yoto Bechoriv, Al Ko Yisrael Chukim Ashpatim, remember the Torah given at Har Sinai. Now, how will we remember the Torah? If we have the right relationship between the generations, the hearts of the fathers and sons are deeply connected to one another, that's how we will keep the memory of Torah Moshe flowing down the generations. So I think we don't have to explain Avotu Banim as directly talking about returning to God, but if the generations are connected, that's how we'll stay in contact with the Torah, with God. And I'd like to share with you two stories uh, relating to these ideas in the Mishnah. A number of years ago, I was in London for Shabbos. I went to Bimit Tidavin at the Marble Arch Synagogue. And it turned out that week there was a bar mitzvah of some boy from London. And the chief rabbi of England, Rav Yonatan Sachs, showed up for the bar mitzvah. And he got up and he, and he, he said, you know what? In the ancient world, there were two nations that sought 
eternity. The Egyptians and the Jewish people. And they both succeeded, each in their own way. The Egyptians sought eternity by building magnificent monuments to withstand the winds of time. And indeed, everybody in the world has have heard of the great pyramids of Egypt. The Jewish people took a different approach. The Ami leaves Mitzrayim, and the first thing Moshe chooses to talk about is Vigarata Levincha. Tell it over to your children. The, the, the way of Am Yisrael of achieving eternity is by having every generation faithfully passing over the heritage to the next generation. And I'd like to share a personal story that highlights the difference between these, these two forms of eternity. We were once visiting my parents who live in Manhattan, and my wife took the children to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And there's a magnificent Egyptian wing to the, in the Metropolitan Museum. And my kids were a little bit bored being in the museum for such a long time. So when they got to the Egyptian wing, they were sure that they got to the playground. So my, one of my children started climbing up on this big, fierce-looking stone sphinx. When, and from that moment on, my wife had a personal escort by a lo very large black guard in the Egyptian section. When they left the section, my wife was sure that the guard would give a sigh of relief. But in fact, he approached her and said, Is that Hebrew your children are speaking? And it turns out that this was a very religious Christian guard. And he was amazed to see that little lively kids speaking the language of the Bible. So there in a nutshell, we were able to see two forms of eternity. An eternity of death, which are what the Egyptian pyramids are all about, or an eternity of life, which is a Jewish approach of having the good connection with the next generation and passing over the Masora, the tradition, allowing us to always know Zechru Torah Moshe Avdi. I'd like to share one additional story. Um, in um, the first Israeli soldier killed in Ofrat Yitzuka, um, in the campaign to stop the bombing of southern Israel from Aza, was Devir Amanoelov. And I was, when I read about his, his story, I was very moved because I read that Devir his father, Netanel, had passed away a year before, and nevertheless, he chose to be in a combat unit, um, despite the fact that his, um, often there are exemptions when, you're, when you've lost a, a family which has lost a parent. Um, and what I didn't realize is that I had a personal connection to the story, because shortly after he was killed, his, um, he, I discovered that his, his mother had had a weekly chavrusa in my book, Nishmat Mishnah, The Soul of Mishnah, and in memory, of, um, in memory of his father, every Shabbos he would learn together with his mother. And his mother contacted me after, um, after the war, and she tells me on the phone, do you know what the last chapter we studied together before Devere was killed? And without even thinking, I, there are 50 chapters in the book, but right away, Intuitively, I knew what the answer would be. I knew that this would be the chapter. Because this was the chapter which was so appropriate to the life and also death of Devere, who was so linked to his father, to his mother, and tragically, much too early, he joined his, his father. A year afterwards, his mother asked at the memorial for me to continue with the next, by, and teach the next chapter in the book of Nishmat Mishnah which is a chapter, um, the chapter that they didn't have a chance to study together. And there too I felt how this, even the coming chapter was so connected to, to the Veer's life. Um, the structure of the first chapter of Mishnah Kedushin, the first half talks about Kinyanim, ten different types of items that are things that we do with Kinyan, starting from the relationship between man and wife, which is called kinyan, and going through a long list of things that are called kinyan. The second half of the chapter deals with 
mitzvot deals with the um, principles relating to mitzvot. Now, and a famous question is, what's the relationship between the first half of the chapter that talks about kinyanim and the second half that talks about mitzvot? Um, and I feel that there's imperative to see the connection because if you look carefully, we'll see that there are exactly ten different items that of kinyan discussed in the first half of the chapter, and there are ten principles governing mitzvot that appear in the second half of the chapter. Um, I believe that the connection is that in the turning point between the Mishnayot, it says, um, there's, it talks about what's called Kinyan Chalipin, an exchange. That, that we, I take an item, I am, the Mishnah says that I am a Mishnah Vav. <coughs> it says, Hichlif Shor Bapara or Chamor Bashor. We want to change animals. I, when I take, when I take the animal that I want, it says, the Mishnah says, Nitchayev Bechalifav. I become obligated in giving the return. By making a Kinyan on something, I am Nitchayev, obligated to, to pay up of what, of what I, be, uh, for, of what I, what I've committed myself to. So the first half of the chapter talks about Kinyanim. The second chap half of the chapter talks about Mitzvot. In a turning point, we have the message that by making a kinyan on something, by acquiring something, you are mitchayev. You take upon responsibility. And I think that's the essence of this chapter. In the, in the world, we have kinyanim. We have all sorts of things that we have acquired in, in life in the world. And the message of this chapter is by acquiring things, by making kinyanim, that leads to obligations. And the obligations are the second half of the chapter that talks about the mitzvot. That, in fact, the topics of the second half of the chapter are very similar um, to the first half of the chapter. The first part of the chapter talks about kinyanim. It talks about a kinyan between man and wife. It talks about a kinyan relating to animals. And ends off by talking about kinyan relating to land to, or to the land. The second half talks about mitzvot relating to these different items. And I think this is a very major e message. We are often privileged to have kinyanim, to have all sorts of things that we have managed to acquire throughout life. But we have to be aware that these things come together with responsibilities and obligations. Um, I'll conclude um, by, by mentioning why I feel that that this, this message is so connected to the life and death of the Vir. The, for that Before Afrot Yitzukah, there was a very depressing period within Israel that we felt that the government was not doing their most basic, fundamental duty to its citizens. People were living in cities, being bombed day in, day, day, day out, and the basic, the basic role of a government to defend its citizens was not being fulfilled. And a turning point, I think, in the, in the morale of the nation as a whole, and ultimately in the defense of the south, southern parts of Israel, was Ofrot Yitzukah, that the state of Israel stood up and said, we are going to fulfill our basic responsibility. And despite the, the terrible loss of, of each and every one of the soldiers that were killed during that period, ultimately, we were, the, the south was able to return to a relative state of shalom. And I, and I think this is the essence of this teaching that we've seen today, that, acqu that acquiring things is a blessing, but it's also a source of responsibility. The Jewish people came back to the land of Israel, but we have to be constantly aware that this privilege is something that comes together with responsibility.